in line. What's that? I forgot to start the recording. Oh, now we're recording. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, we need to set something in our program that goes ding, press the button yeah. to record. <laughs> All right. Um, and we divide up the earth in parallel lines from the equator all the way up to the North Pole. Um, and this gives us on the earth, our latitude. Up in the sky, when you all were at my house, some of you, we faced south across the field. And then we measured where a star was by saying, starting at the southern horizon and rising up straight overhead to wherever it was, we would measure it in degrees altitude. Altitude, how high was it in the sky from the southern horizon? Well, that turned out to be the same as your latitude down here on the ground. So in New York, um, we're roughly, I'm gonna round it off, 42 degrees north, almost halfway to the North Pole. So anything that would pass directly overhead would um, be at the same altitude from the southern horizon. It'd be 42 degrees north. Just like we on the ground are 40 degrees north latitude. So to, what you had to do was first find the altitude of the star, the highest it got in the sky. And then on a map of the earth, find that latitude line as Sandy did and any major cities on that. Urgh. And the reason I came up with this idea was about two or three years ago, I forget now when, in Astronomy Magazine, they had a nice article, whole page, on what they call the capital star for us. And that's Capella, that winter star that we've looked at last winter. And we'll look at it again in a couple of months. Um, because Capella passes straight over Washington, D.C., our capital. And once again, I forget. I think Washington, D.C. is at 37, 38, 39 degrees north. Somebody could look that up online real quick. What's the latitude of D.C.? Um, but what was so amazing was, if you follow that latitude that Capella crosses right over, like a superhighway, like Interstate 80, going from New York City to, to Sacramento, that star also crossed over Tokyo and Tehran and Athens and Rome and Madrid and a few other very important capitals in the world. And of course me with my, why is that mind? Thought, wow, I don't believe in astrology but isn't it interesting that there's so many major cities in the world that happen to lie along that latitude north of the equator? And it just so happens that Capella is the star that crosses over all of them. Um, all righty. Did, did, you, did you all, have you all learned how to find your monthly star chart? on the computer and print it out yourself or come here to the library and get it? No, we've, we forgot to try. Okay, we'll have to you, try. you can. Now, would it be hard for you now, Ian's helping out today again, to find the um, October star chart that we use here? I forget what brand. I want you to share it on the screen. Yeah, and share it on the screen. <clears throat> Okay, while Ian is hunting that up, so you can all look at the one on the screen, um, I had asked everybody to find a star called Fomaho, if that's how you pronounce it, um, which is visible now in our southern sky. I think if I just go to the website. And the yeah. Arabic name for it is the lonely one or the one by itself. And it's really true. If you stand in my front yard or any place where you can look to the south, as most of you know, Jupiter is still quite bright and at say 10 o'clock at night, it's really easy to spot Jupiter. But to the left of that, towards the east and a little bit lower, 
towards the southern horizon is this one, I think it's magnitude one star pretty much all by itself. You can't miss it because there's not much around it. Well, Bob, that particular star hangs over Easter Island in uh -huh. the South Pacific. And Can that got me to idea? thinking, we're still hunting here. So um, we're gonna find it here in a minute. Um, that re made me realize that a lot of the stars we see, and I'm gonna talk about the bright ones, like Sirius, like Fomaho, like Antares, many of our magnitude one and lower, meaning brighter stars, they're really not our stars, we who live in the Northern Hemisphere. They actually are part of the celestial sky in the Southern Hemisphere. So my guess is off the top of my head, anything that is say 40 degrees above the Southern horizon in altitude is really in the Southern sky. And because of the curve of the earth, we can see those that are in the northern part of the southern hemisphere sky. <coughs> so um, if you live right on the North Pole, that dot up there on the top of the earth, um, you could see all the skies, stars that are in the northern hemisphere, all the way down to the equator. If you lived on the equator in a high desert, like in Chile, maybe? Bob could tell us if that's on the equator. Um, that's actually a little south. No, right, okay, up in Ecuador then, if there's still desert up there in between the mountains. Um, you could actually see all the stars from the, the Polaris would be way up on your northern horizon right on the ground, right on the horizon. And what if there was one in similar in the Southern hemisphere, which there isn't, you could see it too. So the people that live right on the equator get to see everything. And the rest of us only see part of it. So Ian is still working on, oh, he's almost got it. <laughs> and now he just has to make it bigger so you can see it. And then we're gonna find Fomaho, which if we were down on, huh, what Bob? Spell that. Okay, I think it's F O. I got it. Okay, spell it. F O something F M A. Okay, what is it? F F O M A L H A U T. Oh boy, I didn't. I got a couple of letters wrong. Okay. Now can we make that bigger? Mm -hmm. And then can you find it and point it out to them? It's the loneliest star near Jupiter and Saturn in this year. And it's. Where is it? Okay. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna... it's going to... Oh, it's right down there. <laughs> Which one? That one? No, not that one. Why didn't I bring my glasses? Well, oh, here it is. There it is. There. there we go. It's right in the middle of the sky at around 10 o'clock at night. And we was, here's Jupiter, which is above it, you see. So it's closer to the southern horizon. And it's in a fairly empty space. All these other stars are, I don't know magnitude three, four, five, and then you can't see them with your naked eye beyond five or six. Although Alex probably could see him. She had really good eyes. <laughs> did she spot the moons without the bird scope or did, or no. not? No. She, she saw didn't. them instantly, all four of them with the bird scope. And some of us could only see one. <laughs> all right. I have a little information about this stuff. Okay, go with it. Uh, it's the third brightest star known to have a planetary system after Earth and Pollux. 
It's used in navigation because of conspicuous place in a region lacking bright stars. It's nearly two times the size of our Earth, and there are early indications of planets in process of formation around this star because of rings of dust and gas. All right. And let's see. How far away is it? Does it say in light years? I didn't write it down. That's okay. That doesn't, it, it's all right. It serves as, it's a class A star and it serves as a stable anchor point by which other stars are classified. Right. It seems that when you're trying to discover where stars are, especially when you're a beginner, if they're really bright, it helps. Or if they're kind of sort of bright and in, in the middle of a nowhere space, what's that? 25 light years away. All right. Oh, very good. Um, and then sometimes certain stars have certain colors that make them more obvious than others, like Antares, remember, and Betelgeuse, quite red-ish. Um, all right. I want to review a few definitions because the more we talk about this, the more sophisticated we get. And we can't just point our finger up and say, well, straight overhead. There's a word for that. <laughs> <laughs> so let me go through these. Um, first of all, altitude has to do with how high the star is above the southern horizon. And that equals the latitude on the Earth, where, where you are. So for instance, Polaris is at 90 degrees north latitude. It's also at 90 degrees north altitude. The zenith is the height of a star or a planet, the sun at midday, which before we started messing with time, like daylight savings time, which we'll talk about maybe next time. Noontime was always considered the middle of the day. So noon was midday, or another word for mid halfway is meridian. It was on the meridian, the halfway point. AM then, which we all use, but whoever thinks to say, well, what does the AM stand for? Ante meridian, before. If you watch all these crime scenes and the pathologist is in there poking away at the body, they often use the word um, ante mort, before death, or post mortem, after death. Um, you know, they stabbed the body before he died and he died. Or the body was stabbed for some weird reason after he died. So AM and PM, before and after the meridian. Now, uh, there was something that I discovered about 10 years, 15 years ago, which I thought was fascinating. Once again, it's a perfect example of how we assume that how we do it or understand it is one, normal, two, everywhere, three, forever. And that's not true. When we look at our clock, which was only invented somewhere in the 1300s, I think, in Europe, I think. Um, now we look at the clock, we say, okay, well, our clocks have 12 hours on them, but we run through the AM and the PM hours. So, we, and in the military and some other places, it's a 24 hour clock because somewhere along the line, they decided there would be 24 hours in a day. And what we do now is, we have 24 hours and each hour has 60 minutes and they're all even. A minute is a minute is a minute. And an hour is an hour is an hour. Doesn't matter whether it's from one in the morning to two in the morning or from 11 or you know, late in the morning till noontime. However, in the middle ages, back in the days of the monasteries in particular, who, if you know your Christian history, they had a strict regimen they followed, especially the Dominicans, of I think five times a day, maybe six, where they paused in their work and their prayer and their sleep, and they said certain prayers at certain hours of the day. Well, back in the day, 
an hour was not a rigid 60 minutes like we have decided to make it. Rather, they said sunrise to sunset. We will divide that time into 12, which meant up in England, for instance, that in the summertime, an hour was 70 minutes in our time. And in the winter, it was only 50 minutes. Which, of course, Brother Catfell, a, a um, fictional monk who lived in the 1100s in a monastery in England, went to see it once. <laughs> anyway, the, by the way, the lady at the library at the, mon at the church was very annoyed at me and reminded me, well, Cattle wasn't a real person, but this was a real church. <laughs> anyway, um, he always enjoyed the hours in the winter because you could sleep longer. It was 70 minutes instead <laughs> of only 50. Um, but I think that's something really interesting. Um, time, what is it? We'll talk about this some other time when we have lots of time. But it's once again, we somehow try to think of it with constructs in our mind that we create to make it understandable and to some extent we think controllable. So that was how they set it up in the old time. And then um, I wanted to review because I think it's important. Um, it's the earth side of astronomy. We talked about latitude and longitude last time, but once again, Sometimes things go in one ear and out the other, especially when um, we don't, I'm not right there with you and we don't have a blackboard to write things on and it's just words. Some people learn by words better than reading, but most people by reading. Um, so I want to review again, latitude um, are those parallel lines going from the equator north up to the poles. Remember, we're forgetting the Southern hemisphere. They were all parallel. So the distance that you travel every degree north is the same. And I think it's about 70 miles um, for every degree north. Now, let me see here. I remember this picture. Yep. If we still, do we still have on the pictures from last time where we had the globe? Yep. Let's put that back on then. All righty. Now I want you to, to do an imagination in your mind. Let's picture the sphere. And remember, of course, it's not a perfect sphere. Um, it's slightly flattened at the top and the bottom because of centrifugal force. Yeah, that's fine. Um, but it's almost a sphere. So we can call it a sphere. Um, now, we're all old enough to remember records. Ian, you know what CDs are, right? I know what records are. You too. know what records are, too? Good for you. <laughs> anyway, let's imagine our north, from starting at the equator, we slice the earth into a thin slice right along the equator. Now we have a record that has a diameter, about 8,000 miles, and um, a circumference, 24,000 miles round. Every slice we take, every degree north we go, that record is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And finally, it's just a point at the top where the pole is. OK, got that so far. Therefore, if you live right smack on the equator, you want to use your pointer, point out the equator, you could be standing, sitting, lying down on the equator and you think you're just lying there peacefully and calmly, but you're really twirling around from the west towards the east, around and around and around, once every 24 hours. And since it's 24,000 miles around, simple math, you're moving at 1,000 miles an hour if you live on the equator. But take your little arrow. Halfway up where we live, you can see that's a much smaller circle going around. But since all the records from top to bottom are hooked together, we're not spinning at different speeds, we're all going around together. That means in that 
24 hours. Ian and me sitting up here at roughly 42 degrees north, we're not traveling as fast, right? If you have an hour to go a thousand miles, but where we are, you still have an hour, but you only have 660 miles to go, you're not moving as fast. And when you get to the point at the top, to some extent, you're just spinning on your axis and you're really not going anywhere. <laughs> Math is such fun. All right, where was I going with this? Okay. Um, that also explains those folks, some of you like Bob and Ann, I think have had tours, bird tours down along, somewhere along the equator. Dusk, the evening, when after the sun goes down, very quickly, the dark, dark comes. Compared to the further north you are, twilight lingers longer in the evening and takes longer in the morning. And that's because we're rotating at different speeds. All right, now, I'm sure most of you years ago, that well, there's been several, several versions of this movie, Mutiny on the Cane, uh, no, what is it called? Mutiny on the Bounty. I happen to see the one with, um, what's his name, back in the 60s, I think, but it's been made several times. But there was an important scene towards the end of the movie where the crew destroys the sextant which back in, when did that movie take place? I don't know, 1700s? If you didn't have a sextant and you were in the middle of some island in the middle of the Pacific, you had no real way to figure out how to get home again. So in a sense, the sailors who had mutinied destroyed the ability of the wreck to be repaired and to get them back someday to England where they all would have been hung. So why would they want to go back to England? Um, <laughs> Well, a sextant is, a, who knows what a sextant is out there? Anybody? I'm sure somebody does. They're all asleep. <laughs> <laughs> you that or shy, Mary Lou. Okay. Make a wild guess, Debbie. Uh, well, it looks like a compass to me, but I think it, it measures um, up to the star from where you are located on the water. Okay. So you can figure out where you are located on the earth. North and south of the equator. The, the sextant, and it was the sun that they measured, usually the Western um, sailors, unlike the Polynesians, which also use the stars. And we do use the stars now, but usually in those days at noontime, and they had to know when noontime was, meaning halfway between sunrise and sunset, when the sun was at its zenith, which did not mean overhead necessarily, but in its arc, whatever that arc was across the sky, when it reached the halfway point at the zenith, they would, the sextant measured the angle between the horizon and the sun, which and was always in the Northern hemisphere, the sun was always in the south of you as long as you were north of the Tropic of Cancer. But anyway, um, and then they knew what latitude they were on, but where on that latitude, they had no clue. Now, who, Regina, did you have a chance out there when I at the last minute asked you to come up with the date of the chronometer? Yes, I did. It was invented by John Harrison, a British horologist in 1735. 1735. Oh, that was earlier than I thought. What what was his, his main field? John his... Harrison. What was he? Just a second. John Harrison, a British horologist, which What's is a it? maker of clocks or watches. Oh, okay. All and right. it's a portable timekeeping device of great accuracy, particularly used to determine longitude at sea. All right. So that was the prop, 1735. Um, so when poor old Columbus <laughs> headed off towards the edge of the earth, some people thought he would fall off, right? Because it was flat. He thought it was flat. Um, he really had no way of knowing how far he was going or where he was in the, in the Atlantic Ocean as far as east or west went. 
Now, does anybody know how a chronometer works? Any Boy Scouts in the? Yep. Bob? Well, chronometer is simply a clock that can keep accurate time. Mm -hmm. even, even when out on the ocean getting tossed around, unlike a pendulum clock, which ah. cannot cannot uh, I, don't, okay. I don't know specifically how it works it's got to have right. some sort of statement in it well it in and of itself doesn't work you need two clocks and let me see i'm going to read off my example here so i don't get it mixed up um where am i don't know where i am wait a second here i'm on page three i guess longitude here we go <laughs> All right, somewhere along the line in the 17 and 1800s in particular, England <clears throat> took over from the uh, Spanish as far as sea power went and began to really explore the oceans and all the world around these various new oceans. But originally people never sailed out of sight of land because they, they might not ever be able to find out how to go back. So um, in Greenwich, England, and that's gonna be, um, I'm gonna give that to um, Regina as a, an assignment for next time. When did the observatory in Greenwich, England get established? Because by this late 1700s, it was an important um, place for astronomers and when it was decided, when they figured out how to use two clocks to tell where they were, east and west longitude, they used Greenwich, the observatory in England, as the zero point. And they divided the hemispheres to the west, the Western hemisphere, and going into Europe and Asia, the Eastern hemisphere. And if you take your fingers and start at Greenwich and go around the earth, to the backside, you're somewhere in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And they named that, which is 180 degrees around, halfway around, the International Date Line. You did you find out? Okay, Ian has, a, in a few minutes, we're gonna talk about that. <coughs> but what they did was, they had an accurate clock sitting there in Greenwich that told the time at Greenwich, ground zero, zero degrees, east-west longitude. Then you kept another accurate clock on your ship. So when you, and you, and you um, let me think, you had another, the, the second clock on the ship told Greenwich time, and then your clock told your time. And so if the Greenwich clock said 2 p.m. and your clock said 11 a.m. on the boat, there was a three hour discrepancy there. So when I called Jordan, you were still awake, Jordan? Uh-oh. Jordan, wake up. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. See, he's three hours earlier than we are. We're about 1.30 now. What is it, 10.30 in San Diego? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, same thing on the boat. Why is this? We're all here on the earth. Why is he three hours earlier than me? I was that boat three hours west of Greenwich, three hours earlier than the time in Greenwich. Well, sorry guys, it's math again, but it's simple. 360 degrees, that's an arbitrary number. Somebody decided on that. I don't know when. And it doesn't matter if it's on the equator or way up here where we are. Um, it's still 360 degrees. It's just that the distance between the degrees is going to shrink as you go north until you get to that point where there's no difference between them <laughs> at the North Pole. Um, so there's 24 hours in the day. You divide 24 into 360 and you get every hour you've moved one way or the other, plus or minus the hour, 15 degrees. So voila, the captain of the boat looks at his two clocks and says, oh, we're three hours earlier than at Greenwich. That means we are 15, 30, 45 degrees west. 
out here in the Atlantic Ocean. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that longitude is time, not distance. Because the distance along the equator is going to be longer than the distance up here. But if you know the time, you know your place on that north-south line. And then with your sextant, you get your latitude. And you got a point, the intersection of two lines, good old Euclidean geometry, which more or less works. Um, you've got a point and you know where you are. Isn't that clever? Now, out of that basic system grew what we call celestial navigation, where Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, the Navy, um, I'm sure special forces. You know, you can't always lie, rely on your modern gear. Sometimes it doesn't work. But as long as the sky is clear at night, you can tell where you are. And I think the great irony of this, and you can double check, because this happened, I'm thinking, 15 or so years ago. Our Naval Academy down in Baltimore, Orland, um, Baltimore, Maryland, Maryland thank you, um, always taught their cadets a few courses in celestial navigation. And somewhere along the line, 15, 20 years ago, somebody said, oh, we don't need that anymore. We have GPS. That's hard to learn. That's a lot of stuff to learn. It's not easy to learn. All you have to do is press the button and there you are. You'll know exactly where the boat is. <laughs> Anybody that has ever used GPS in their cars knows that that's not true. <laughs> and I'm sorry, guys, if you get lost going to Laguna Beach in the theater like we did in California, that's one thing. But if at a crucial moment in our military business. We don't know where the hell we are. Exactly. We're in trouble. So after a few years, they decided to reinstate the celestial <laughs> navigation courses. Now I'm assuming they're still teaching it. I don't really know because that was just, you know, the news 10 or so years ago. Um, but anyway. Um, all righty. To do to do. That's also why right now, England, sometimes I'm up at four in the morning. England happens to be 75 degrees east of us. And so there are five hours east of us. And so for me at four in the morning, it's nine o'clock there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, nine o'clock in the morning. And they're doing one of their major news reports on the BBC. So at four in the morning here, I can hear what's happening in Europe through the BBC uh, fought because they're five hours ahead of us. Now, I had Ian look up because as some of you know, my dad was one of the China Marines. So in 38, he was shipped out to China. And because it was supposed to be a four year deployment with the 4th Marine Corps, he was gonna be there for four years so he could take my mom. So off they went and um, they crossed the Pacific. And then that's where I was born in Shanghai and then um, about a year before the war started, the Marine Corps sent all the women and kids home. My dad stayed into the summer and then fortunately his unit was sent home too. So he didn't get stuck at the beginning of the second world war at the end of 41, like some of the British friends of ours got stuck and then they were taken as prisoner of war or killed. So anyway, either coming or going, my mother told me the tale when they crossed the international date line, 183, 80 degrees, the backside of the earth from Greenwich, England, halfway around in the ocean. They had a ceremony and it was most, it was a military ship that they were on. And whoever was the youngest Marine or Navy, no Navy guy, he was stuck with the task that day that they crossed the line to climb the mast to the crow's nest. Is that, that's what it's called, right? Mm -hmm. And with a handmade pair of binoculars out of Coke bottles, Every hour he had to climb up there, look around the horizon and holler out as loud as he could, Thursday, Thursday, where art thou Thursday? Because they, in crossing the line, um, they lost Thursday. <laughs> so I asked, and I can never remember. I've looked this up probably 10 times. I've got to figure out a way to remember. Which way are we going when we lose a day? To the east. 
Okay. So she lost it when she came home. Right. So when she came home and I was eight months old baby in the crib or whatever I was in, um, they lost Thursday, which means if you go back the other way, you gain mm -hmm. a day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got to remember coming home is when they lost Thursday. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So, but once again, it's like daylight savings time and the cows. I lived in um, both Indiana and Kentucky for a couple of years at different times. And whenever daylight savings time started, all the dairy farmers were just so annoyed because it was like the cows still did their thing when the sun was at a certain place <laughs> in the sky. It had nothing to do with the clock on your wrist, <laughs> the watch on your wrist. Okay, so time is a funny thing. And- um, Mary Lou? Yeah. This is Bob. Uh, you know, the, you know, there really is only one time. It's just how we keep track of it. Yep. But it does result in funny things. Yes, in, it does. Um, in 1997, 98, Ann and I flew from Los Angeles to Auckland, New Zealand, nonstop. Okay. All right. We left on eight o'clock. <laughs> 8 p.m. Uh, well, about 8:30 Los Angeles time on the 30th, we arrived at 6 a.m. Auckland time on the 1st. The 31st just was gone. Yep. Not only did we lose a day, we in a way lost two days. Two or days. Part part thereof. Uh, and the interesting thing, I also just recently, you know, I've been looking at the globe a lot to, during these set various sessions. Yeah, you know, ideally, the international dateline should be uh, at 180 degrees longitude, either east or west. Right. But politic politically, there are right. deviations they yep. put in there. And in that flight, nonstop from Los Angeles to Auckland, we actually crossed the international date line three times. Three times. <laughs> three times. Because in coming north to south, there's a place where the politically the line is drawn to the east and uh -huh. then to the south and then back to the west and then back to 180. And then on a great circle route from Los Angeles to uh, Auckland, you cross that little thing that sticks out. Yep. So you cross it, you cross it again, and then you cross the international date line yet a third time. Great. So it's good. It's a good thing we were probably asleep. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, two things. That's true in our own um, country with our four. Well, if you don't count Alaska and Hawaii, uh, down here in the main part of our country, there are four separate time zones, but they don't necessarily run in a straight line north south because some states like Arizona, I always have to stop and I can never remember this either. I think they don't bother going on it. So Arizona in the winter, I think is on mountain time, but in the summer they're on the same time as California, which is Pacific time. Ta -da. And Indiana used to have it running straight down through the middle of the state. And now they've decided, I think all of Indiana is in the Eastern time zone. I think. But um, it gets very confusing. And, um, and it's politics. But so is time zones. I mean, I don't know, you probably heard this, and I forget when, if it was in the late 1800s. But once again, you can check that. When our railroad system first came after the Civil War, we actually had coast to coast for the first time. And somebody in Congress thought, <clears throat> ah, because, because before that, before time zones, every town had its own noon. Noon time was when the moon, sun was straight overhead, halfway up in the daytime. And so Alfred and Wellsville would be, I don't know, a minute off in their noon time. But since nobody traveled, it didn't matter. You had sunrise, you had noon, you had sunset. But when we got the railroad, and business started traveling east-west, <clears throat> it wouldn't matter north and south, but east-west, then all of a sudden these innumerable different noontimes 
and sunrises had to be coordinated. So I think Congress came up with this idea and you can research it. It was years ago that I read this and it gets fuzzy some stuff after years, but they came up with this idea for the railroad to have these four zones roughly at 15 degrees each, one hour each from east to west. And uh, the railroad would run on standard time. And supposedly, according to this apocryphal story, this one congressman was very opposed to this. No, God made time and we weren't supposed to mess around with it. <laughs> However, when vacation time came and he went down to the train to catch the train to go wherever he was, he lived, mm -hmm. the train had already gone because <laughs> it was not on God's time. It was on Sandra time. <laughs> anyway, so, all right, got to move along here. Um, do 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 do. All righty. A reminder, because I think it's so important in general. We, we talked last time about the celestial sphere, that great big sphere that surrounds the whole solar system. So let's pretend our Earth now is the whole solar system, the sun and all the planets. And then around it is this celestial sphere where the ancients believed, of course, every star was stuck on it. So they were all the same distance away. Well, we know that's not true. However, because it simplifies some things, we keep it as a concept. And I was saying to somebody, and I forget who in the last week, we all, I sure hope, we all know <laughs> we do not live on a flat earth. <laughs> but we still say the sun rises in the morning and the sun sets at night, as if we still believed we lived on a flat disk. We don't say, oh, the earth is turning into the sun. <laughs> no, we say sun rises. So even though the celestial sphere and these terminologies are not true in and of themselves, partly it's tradition, it's partly that as we stand on the surface of the sphere, it still seems like we're standing on a flat surface because of our size and its size. Um, most of us in our daily life are not aware of the fact that this earth we're on is tipped at that 23 and a half degree angle. But this also determines how we see our sky. And once again, since we live here, most of us live I've traveled a bit. Have you traveled some, Ian? Mm -hmm. How far up and down from where we are have you gone? The farthest east I've been is Italy. The farthest west is Las Vegas. Okay. The farthest it, south is Florida. Florida in the south. How far north? Is this it? Like Toronto. Toronto. <laughs> okay, that's probably it. So Ian's traveled a bit east and west quite a bit. Vegas to Italy and a little bit north and south. You have to go further north and south to begin to realize, you know what, the, 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 the stars don't seem to be doing what I remember that they do. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, and that's because of the tip of the earth. So what, how we see our stars depends on our location north, say, of the equator. And one good example, most of us know what Orion looks like and its famous three stars in the belt. Because we live halfway up the sphere, let's start at the equator, because it's always easier if you lived at the equator. <laughs> if you were down on the equator. Hello. Yes. Before you leave celestial sphere, because I don't have anything written for it. Yeah. Did you sort of imply that it's like the equator of our solar system? No. The celestial sphere is like a, look here on this map. Can you see the map? Yeah. It's like this, huh? Can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Let's pretend that the Earth is our whole solar system. Oh, so, okay. All right. That's our whole solar system. Then around that is another sphere called the celestial sphere. In the old days, they thought every star was stuck onto it. Think of a beach ball around a baseball. And the baseball is the solar system. 
And on the inside of that, uh, that beach ball, we paint our stars, how they look to us. Now we know that there's no such thing. Those stars are here, there, and yonder, all at different distances from us. Okay, I got it. Okay. Now, the other thing that you might have been thinking of is, you see this line. Ian, you want to run that line there? Yeah, the celestial. Okay. The celestial equator on that outer sphere is right on top of the Earth's equator. So they're lined up. And the celestial poles are right on, over our earthly poles. You see, you all should have taken trigonometry. It's, it's not flat geometry, it's three-dimensional. <laughs> it gets more complicated. Um, okay, if you lived on the equator, and you, and you were looking for Orion in the evening, in the winter time, when Orion came up over the Eastern horizon, Orion would be lying sideways and that belt would line up straight up and down. And that's how it would go over your head at night with that belt always straight up and down aiming east-west. We never see it that way up here. For us, it rises kind of a little bit to the northeast. And so he's tipped. And then as the night progresses, halfway through the night, yes, the tipping means that belt will be up and down straight compared to the horizon, perpendicular. But then it keeps tipping as it sets. So in a sense, Rigel, which was on the bottom right side, and Betelgeuse was on the top left side, they flip when they get to the western horizon at dawn. You could you can make a little model. And, and move it across in an arc and you can see how that happens or draw three diagrams of it. So what we see in the sky depends on two things, two things. First of all, our location and the time of year because we don't see Orion in the summertime up for us at our latitude because it's where, where is it in the summertime? Ian, where's Orion in the summertime? In the Southern Hemisphere. Oh. Well, um, it's right on the equator all year round, but why can't we see it in the summertime? It's on the other side of the... It's in the sunshine. It's in the daytime. It's in the daytime. Right, right, right. Yeah. And all those summers, like Scorpio now, is pretty much disappeared almost. Uh, you can still see it early in the evening, way in the west now, but it will it will disappear into the daytime sky so we don't see scorpio in the winter in the in at night because it's with the sun in the in the daytime sky all righty um here's what here's our assignments for next time okay um now we talked about it a bit but maybe we can do some more bob and ann you ready We're ready. Okay, why don't you look up the celestial sphere? Who in ancient times, I'm guessing it's a Greek, but I don't know for sure that's true. Who came up with that concept and how did they use it? Regina? Okay. Yes. What about the observatory at Greenwich in England? When okay. was that built? Okay. Okay. Mary Lou, are, are you and Jerry tuned in and we just don't see you? No. This will be the first time Jerry, uh, Mary Lou and Jerry have missed. Okay. Uh, Debbie, I got a goodie for you. The history of daylight savings time. Got it. Okay. And... Ian, you want one? Sure. Sure. Okay. In England, they have something called double time, which might have got going in the Second World War. I'm not sure when they started with that. What's double time? And I actually read it in a mystery based in England, based <laughs> during the wartime, and I didn't know what it meant. And I came in and I asked Rima, and she yeah. looked it up for me. So I know what it means. You find out what okay. double time in England is connected to daylight savings time. Who else is out there that doesn't have a question? Oh, Jordan. 
Sandy. Mm. Oh, Sandy. Okay. Um, um, let me think. Oh, I know. Wait, wait. Where did my other questions go? Where's page four? There it is. Okay. Sandy, there yes. are three official. Okay. I tell you what, you look up twilight. What does twilight mean? And what is the Terminator? And I don't mean Schwarzenegger, was he in that movie? Yeah. <laughs> okay. What is the Terminator and what is Twilight? And I'm gonna save one for Mary Lou and Jerry and I'm gonna ask them, um, there are, Twilight is divided into three parts by, for astronomy and they have three separate names and it has three, um, not so much times, but connected to degrees. So we're gonna have Mary Lou look up how we divide twilight into three parts and what it means. So obviously, what are we talking about next time? <laughs> twilight and all this, there are several wonderful astronomical events, observations that we can make only during twilight. And so um, we're gonna talk about that. For everybody, oh, it's probably too late now, but if you get up in the four in the morning or so, five in the morning in two weeks, when there is a waxing, no, waning crescent moon in the early morning pre-dawn light off to the east, see if you can find earth shine. We looked for it the other night at the bird sit, which turned into an astronomy sit. <laughs> um, for those of you who weren't there, we really gathered 10 of us to see, listen to the birds at 630. And all we heard was a, and saw was a crow and some blue jays, raven. And a raven, two ravens and an owl. But Bob had brought his bird scope again. And then we wound up checking out the moons of Jupiter again until the clouds moved in and covered it up. So um, try, and, and we couldn't see moonshine, and no, earthshine on the crescent moon. So try and find that. And, there, and a few other things, you can look up twilight, everybody, if they want to. There's some events that happen in the sky during twilight, either in the evening or in the morning. By the way, that's something I learned. I thought twilight was always just in the evening. No, it's both evening and morning. We tend to call it pre-dawn and dusk, but twilight is the official definition of what the sky is doing at those two times of the day and night. So any questions before we wrap up here? Jordan, you didn't get a question. No, no, I didn't. No. Oh. Let me think. No, oh, I don't know how to spell it. Mm. Help me out with your um, smartphone. Something like Noctilucent, N O C Lucent, or maybe there's a T in there, uh, clouds. You have to spell it perfectly or will it come up if you aha okay could you spell that for jordan n-o-c-t-i-l-u-c-e-n-t -E did you get that jordan yeah did, did you get the spelling or do you want him to do it again i got it okay so your assignment um it's one of those rare things that really you almost have to live much further north or south towards the poles to spot, but it's a wonderful um, after twilight event within an hour of twilight ending. You can possibly spot it. What are they and um, how can we see, why do we see them? What causes it? Ta -da. Okay. Okay, any last questions guys? I should write that down. Remind me to write that down. Okay. See you in two weeks. I'll see some of you sooner. Goodbye.
Bye. Bye. Thanks, Marina. Thanks.